It's been estimated that an average American living in the cities sees up to 4,000 ads a day. Ads are everywhere you look. Subways, bus stops, billboards, magazines. This toxic culture of mindless consumption exploits our innermost insecurities and desires to meet impossible standards. The corporate PR machine is enormously successful due to a model created by a man named Edward Bernays nearly a century ago. The nephew of Sigmund Freud Bernays is considered the father of modern propaganda, or public relations. An Austrian aristocrat, Bernays' first contribution to the United States was helping President Woodrow Wilson sell the idea of World War I as a noble mission to spread democracy in Europe. In order to create the engineering of consent, Bernays argued, you must appeal to the unconscious mind. And on behalf of numerous corporate clients, Bernays helped perfect the tools of manipulation and conditioning that are used today. To understand more about the history of propaganda and the collusion between the U.S. Empire and Fourth Estate, I talked to a professor of media studies at New York University, Mark Crispin Miller, who wrote the intro to the new edition of Bernays' 1928 seminal book, Propaganda. When did public opinion begin to stand out as a force to be managed by the establishment? For all intents and purposes, I think it's probably uh, most accurate to say that World War I marked an important turning point in uh, the rise of uh, what we call public opinion as a consideration uh, for political leaders and the, the science of, of propaganda, uh, which was used and has been used with increasing sophistication to um, move public opinion in certain directions, uh, basically to make sure that we don't uh, succumb to anything like real democracy, you know? I mean, public opinion has to be respected, but not out of any respect for the popular will. It has to be respected as, as, as a, a kind of mighty beast that needs to be tamed uh, unless democracy uh, break out and upset the apple cart. In the introduction you wrote to Bernays' book, Propaganda, you said his aim was not to urge the buyer to demand the product now, but to transform the buyer's very world so that the product must appear to be desirable as if without the prod of salesmanship. Talk about how this strategy has been institutionalized. What, what Bernays understood uh, brilliantly was, was the need to kind of shape uh, the, the flow of events to influence the media in a general way, to create an atmosphere in which uh, large numbers of people would end up making certain choices, uh, coming to certain conclusions without really being aware of any stimulus, you see. So he had a lot of contempt for advertising because it was too explicit, it was too blatant. It was, say, it was saying, buy this. I mean, it wasn't quite as simplistic as he made it sound. He badmouthed advertising and disdained it in favor of his own method. It was to kind of create the climate in which people would do certain things to benefit his clients. Uh, my favorite example is that, you know, he, he, he represented a, p a piano company. How to get people to buy pianos? Well, he did this by creating a craze for music rooms in homes, right? He actually contacted people in the architectural magazines and so on, and in the news media, uh, people who wrote about lifestyle and so on. Well, they didn't use that term then. In order to create a kind of trend for music rooms. Okay, well, you have a music room, what are you gonna put in it? I mean, obviously, most uh, you know, middle and upper middle class people wanna buy pianos, you see? So even though he never mentioned the name of the piano company, and didn't even harp on pianos per se in the propaganda, it had the, the general net effect of, in, of getting people to buy more pianos, so the client was happy. Uh, he, he had you know, a contract to help increase sales for American tobacco, and one of the most important things that he did to that end was to uh, get Hollywood 
to incorporate cigarette smoking much more consciously and, and often artfully into the scenarios of, of movies, you know, to, to get them to write cigarette smoking, lighting up and so on, to write all that into the stories, you see. So it, it developed a kind of, uh, you know, grammar of, you know, seduction and, you know, you could express various kinds of emotions with cigarettes depending on, you know, uh, who lit you up or <laughs> whatever. But the point I'm trying to make is that he, he understood that the inexplicit, uh, uh, the kind of inexplicit influence, you know, uh, just creating a large scale uh, a shift in the weather, you know, to get people to do certain things. That was his great, uh, his great insight, you see. And, and now you ask, how did that, uh, how did that come to uh, define our world, basically? Mm -hmm. Well, um, let, let me answer that question by stepping back mm -hmm. to say that I think that we live at a moment when propaganda has never been so pervasive, has never been so uh, influential, has never been so uh, dangerous. And I mean propaganda. I know that the word sounds terribly quaint. I say propaganda, people think of, uh, you know, Chinese voices coming squawking over loudspeakers in, in Beijing, or they think of Soviet posters, right? or Nazi propaganda, they think of Leni Riefenstahl. Uh, actually, uh, propaganda is not a totalitarian phenomenon primarily, although we, we have long since learned to think that it is, right? Propaganda is as American as apple pie. Propaganda at its most sophisticated was perfected, and I mean not just political propaganda, but commercial propaganda. Both kinds of propaganda were perfected jointly by the United States and Britain. You know, in Mein Kampf, Hitler, in his famous chapter on war propaganda, talks about how deeply he admired what a brilliant job the British propagandists had done in World War I, had nothing but contempt for the German propaganda, and, and you know, resolved to make sure that his own and the Nazi Party's propaganda would be brilliant in imitation of the British, you see? So, you know, uh, how, how many people does the, the world of propaganda employ in the United States, if you think about it? I mean, it isn't only people in public relations. It's also people in advertising agencies. It's also people in the world of so-called public diplomacy. It's also people in the world of what we call lobbying. There are countless euphemisms that we use today for propaganda, right? If you go up to a person in an ad agency or a PR specialist and say, well, uh, how's the propaganda going, you know? They're going to be insulted. They're going to feel like you've, you've called them a dirty name. They don't understand that they do propaganda, right? They do propaganda. And the rise of all those euphemisms for it is a direct result of the successful effort to cast propaganda as something that they do in those closed societies. The Russians do it. The Chinese do it. The Iranians do it. The Venezuelans do it. The Cubans do it. We don't do it. We educate people. We provide them with information. And that uh, misrepresentation of propaganda has had the paradoxical effect of making it extraordinarily effective. See, because propaganda works best when you don't see it for what it is. The level of sophistication is completely unreal. And it's not just people being aware of the propaganda and commercialism coming at them, tens of thousands of advertisements every day, and being able to tune them out. <clears throat> it's things beyond that, the implants within the propaganda. Talk about that, the layers. That's a good point. I mean, first of all, I want to say people tend to pride themselves on not falling for propaganda. Mm -hmm. People say, you know, I. Commercials don't work on me. You know, I can see through them. And there are, there are a number of ad campaigns that have successfully appealed to that idea, you know, the kind of winking, ironic advertising. It and you share a little, a little chuckle or a little smirk over the fact that you're too smart to fall for this, right? This is kind of a postmodern move that advertising makes. Well, it's been making it in various ways really since the 30s, okay? People don't understand that even if they consciously scorn a particular ad as cheesy or they tell themselves they don't really believe the claims, that has nothing to do with what they'll 
end up buying if they happen to get thirsty and they go into a store somewhere. But, you know, let's, let's move away from the world of what they call white propaganda, which is to say propaganda that announces itself as propaganda. That's TV commercials, political speeches, stuff like that, you know. And let's move into the world of what we call gray propaganda, which is propaganda that disguises itself as journalism or, uh, you know, any number of dodges and disguises that propaganda puts on, right? Product placement in movies is a form of gray propaganda, you know. And then a movie like Argo, for example, or Zero Dark Thirty, to move to more sinister examples, are, are movies that have a kind of geopolitical agenda uh, that are, uh, you know, making a case for very powerful interests within the state, uh, movies that the CIA has actually uh, helped the producers uh, make, you know. And let's talk about what's behind the propaganda. Bernays is quoted as saying, we are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we've never heard of. Who are the invisible governors that are controlling these ideas? Yeah, well, it, it, it's important to note that Bernays didn't think of that as a bad thing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he, the heroic elite. Yeah, he thought that was a good thing because his assumption was that these um, august figures, these mighty uh, figures in the worlds of business and politics and the media uh, were essentially benign. He, he actually believed that. He thought there was a, a kind of rationality operating up top, you know, uh, which, you know, as I point out in my own introduction to the new edition of propaganda, is a groundless claim. Uh, because often people who devote themselves to propaganda end up believing it themselves. You know, uh, if you have a vested interest in a particular version of the truth, you're going to believe it. It goes into just here we are today where 90% of what Americans see, hear, and read is controlled by six corporations, six giant umbrella corporations. How? How does this function? You've, you've called it a cartel because it seems like every single outlet echoes the exact same narrative and pro-U.S. bias. Yes, that's right. You know, um, for a long time I used to think that what's happened to the media is entirely a matter of, uh, you know, runaway deregulation, uh, too much concentration of power, you know, too few independent voices, uh, too little broadcast regulation and so on. And I, I think that that has a great deal to do with it. but. I, I, I now realize that there, there's, there's another factor that has to be considered as well, and that is the um, energetic involvement of, of the covert side of our own government in, in the news and entertainment business. Uh, countless people within the media are either wittingly involved with you know, our intelligence agencies, uh, you know, which is something that started to be exposed in the 70s with the congressional hearings, not just the CIA, but the FBI as well. I thought that it was a matter of uh, real concern that planted stories intended to serve a national purpose abroad um, came home and were circulated here and believed here because uh, this would mean that the CIA could manipulate the news in the United States by channeling it through some foreign country. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. But then there are also a lot of people who are, uh, you know, manipulated in traditional ways. Uh, you know, they have sources inside the government who will give them certain tips, give them certain stories, and they end up becoming dependent on those sources for that kind of information. They break really big stories and so on. And then they, I think without even knowing it, end up carrying water 
for uh, those agencies. You can hire people, you can actually pay them, you can have them under contract, right? Which is chilling and wrong in a democracy for the government to be paying people who are supposed to be providing the public with news to uh, you know, basically insert state propaganda into that news. It's wrong, but it's, it's only one way of many in which the press and often uh, the entertainment industries uh, end up reflecting, you know, uh, serving the agenda of, of, of the state and, and very, very powerful corporations. How else to explain the bizarre unanimity that we notice today uh, of the press on certain stories that they somehow managed to get absolutely wrong over and over and over and over. I mean, I've been around for a long time studying the media in this country for decades. I've really never seen anything like this. There's an Alice in Wonderland quality to it because we live in a, a country that prides itself on freedom of expression and the marketplace of ideas. And yet we see over and over and over and over again on issue after issue, there's a certain, a certain truth that is enforced with with uh, exactly the same kind of, of, of ruthlessness and impatience with any disagreement that you'll find in, in countries like North Korea. It's not like it's some big conspiracy theory where there's just a hundred guys in a room smoking, figuring out, here, we're gonna pull this on this news agency, Fox is gonna air this. The interlocking boards of directorates, the sponsorship, the direct-to-consumer advertising, especially when it comes to pharmaceutical agencies, how would you say it works? Is it just a machine functioning on its own and people are self-censoring and they just know they can't touch certain subjects? Sometimes it happens, uh, you know, uh, at the moment because of a particular interest exerting pressure. A lot of times it happens in this way, you know, their particular interest is vigilant in its own defense, is on the lookout for any kind of coverage that's going to screw with their bottom line, and then they, this has been going on for a hundred years, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you raised a really important point at the end of your question about um, self-censorship, mm -hmm. right? And you used the phrase conspiracy theory a moment ago, and I think it's important that we talk about that because that will help us understand exactly how this works, you know, conspiracy theory. People like me, uh, people like you, are often, you know, dismissed, ridiculed, derided as conspiracy theorists. And this has become especially um, urgent and kind of vehement recently where David Cameron of Britain actually said twice that conspiracy theorists are as dangerous as ISIS. We must be clear, to defeat the ideology of extremism, we need to deal with all forms of extremism, not just violent extremism. And after the Charlie Hebdo thing, Francois Hollande uh, came out and said they were actually gonna come up with legislation to make conspiracy theory illegal. Okay, his notion of conspiracy theory was a weird jumble of you know anti-Semitic fantasies and you know 9/11 truth and people questioning vaccines and you know fans of Putin, fans of Chavez. It was a kind of grab bag of forbidden <laughs> topics. You know what I mean? But actually, to make it illegal, right? Conspiracy theory illegal? Well, you know when we when we hear this kind of hysterical attack on, on on what they call conspiracy theory, we have to ask ourselves, what exactly is that? What, where did that come from? What do they mean? You know, and having been myself uh, kind of marginalized as a conspiracy theorist right after I came out with my book on election fraud, uh, Fooled Again, 2005. I became very interested in this question, you know, since when are we worried about something called conspiracy theory? Well, the answer to the question is that the notion of conspiracy theory, you know, that meme uh, was pretty much non-existent in American journalism until the late 60s. If you go back and look into the archives of the New York Times, or the Washington Post, and you type in conspiracy theory, you'll find very few uh, examples. And the examples you will find are very inconsistent. The, the phrase is used in many different ways. Starting in 1967, there's a change. And this has everything to do with the fact that it was in the spring of 1967 that the CIA sent a memo out to all station chiefs worldwide 
alerting them to the fact that there had just been published a number of books attacking the Warren Commission report. The memo defends the Warren Commission report and urges the uh, station chiefs for the CIA all over the world to use their propaganda assets and friends in the media to discredit the work of these authors wherever possible. From that moment on, we find conspiracy theory popping up more and more often, used over and over and over and over again, and always in the same way, okay? It's always used, or almost always used, to attack people who are raising questions about state crimes, okay? So it's the Kennedy assassination, or the Bobby Kennedy assassination, or the King assassination. It's Iran-Contra, you know? It's election fraud. I hate the, the way that the language has been hijacked to the point where you can't even talk about real open conspiracies that are documented. You can talk about a couple conspiring to kill their child. You can't talk about <coughs> Wall Street conspiring or financial institutions conspiring to rig currency markets, which we know just happened. I mean, these conspiracies are off limits. That's right. Let's talk about going back to the media in terms of, you know, it wasn't just that they were complicit in selling the Iraq war. It's every war. It's every issue doubling down on U.S. militarism and basically neoliberal doctrine. Um, every time there's anything going on, there's just this slew of military generals on TV and, and also in these alt publications and online journals and such. It's just bizarre. It's like, how, how did that play out? Yeah, just a few cranks out, out there in the world of alternative journalism will raise questions about the propriety of having all these generals appear as talking heads to, you know, to bless the latest military adventure. <laughs> and, and they're always on the boards of the big defense contractors, defense contractors. This is how propaganda works, right? It gets, it gets worked into the language that we all use. Yeah, defense. defense. It's not defense, you know. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're they're all they're all basically singing from the same uh, uh, sheet music, you know. And this has been increasing, intensifying, tightening up since since the 70s, where, where there was a, a a brief moment of a kind of uh, uh, uncertainty and division, you know, um, a, a response to the mm -hmm. Vietnam War, which divided the elites, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there was a moment when I mean, Watergate, of course, uh, enabled people to take a skeptical view of executive power, and the CIA was under fire to some extent, you know, being investigated by Congress. There was a moment there in, in the middle of that decade when there was a, a window kind of cracked open, you know, and uh, that window was uh, quickly slammed shut uh, by the late 70s, and then the so-called Reagan revolution kind of settled our hash for a very, very long time. But, I do think, again, you know, and not just using my own students as an example, but, but you know, young people generally, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, occupy, you know, these, these disparate uh, re 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 rebellions uh, uh, suggest as inequality becomes more and more uh, egregious and obvious and destructive, as austerity measures become more and more lethal, uh, you know, I, people are you know, moving their way towards saying no to things that they hadn't even really thought about uh, just a few years ago. You know, Bernays, of course, existed at a time where there were multiple empires competing. You mentioned that manufacturing public consent went as back as Napoleon. Now that there's one dominant military hegemon, you talked about how the U.S. has perfected what Bernays started, but what is the relationship today between maintaining empire and the propaganda model? Well, I think, the, I think that the propaganda that, that, that batters us all is um, so, you know, repetitious and monotone, you know, precisely because it, it is at the service of a, of a kind of single uh, dominant, uh, use the word hegemon. I think that that's, that's, that's the truth. That's the case, you know. Uh, all of our wars or uh, all of our warlike behaviors, you know, as a nation, seem to be devoted to wiping out any kind of opposition to or divergence from 
the neoliberal program, you know. I mean, they've pretty much done away with uh, a lot of the liberationist movements, you know, that were pretty frisky in the 70s and into the 80s. But we, you know, we do see them going after Venezuela, for example, which is a kind of aftershock from, from, from that long struggle against the left. Uh, but the attacks on you know, uh, regimes that are not leftist in any real progressive sense, you know, like uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq or Gaddafi's Libya or Assad's Syria, uh, are, are, are part of this kind of blind push to wipe out all resistance to create a perfect Pax Americana. <laughs>